Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Here we are December 31st and we're about ready to turn the calendars over, approach the year 2002. And as I uh, c contemplated tonight's program, with all the things that we've been uh, going through over the last couple years, this last fall, with all that happened in New York, the changes that made in our culture, uh, in our lives, and uh, on our patriotism in our nation. I mean, you were seeing, counting people praying, we never thought about praying before, uh, and particularly praying for peace, calling us to peace. As we look to this year ahead, I thought it'd be good to have as my guest someone who could address issues, particularly as we look to the future. And the first person that came to my mind is one who's been on the Journey Home program twice before, Dr. Paul Thigpen. The reason I invited Paul back is because, besides the fact he's a good friend, is that uh, because of his background as a, a Protestant minister, uh, he was very much involved with the apocalyptic, the, the looks to the future, and uh, the different theories about the future, particularly one that uh, you can't go into a bookstore nowadays without finding a book about the rapture, particularly that whole series called the Left Behind series. And Paul has not only uh, written articles and books on the issue of apocalyptic ideals expressed in scripture, uh, Protestant views of the future, but he's taught a course at the college level on these issues. I thought it would be appropriate to invite Paul back to not only talk to us about the issues of the rapture, how we as Catholics particularly should understand that, but not only just Catholics, Protestants. How many Protestants have bought into this idea of the rapture? But that he could talk to us about how should we look at the future as we approach the new year, uh, besides uh, having a big meal and watching football games tomorrow. Uh, you're an important part of this program, so if you would, call us with your questions at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN. Dot com. Paul, welcome to the journey home. Thank you, Marcus. Good to be here again. It's been about a year or two since you've been on I the program. So. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, you were on the first time. You, we chose as the topic of your first appearance, the reality of the devil and demons. That's right. Because, uh, you know, when we tell our stories of, of faith, there are many aspects and facets to our journey, and we wanted to focus on your involvement with the occult and the New Age movement before you had a born-again experience and became a Protestant minister and, and all of that journey. And then you were on here once before with Lisa, right? That's right. Talking mm -hmm. about your conversion as a couple and the, uh, the struggles that that brought yes. in your journey, yes. right? But given our topic tonight, I thought it'd be good for you to review your journey with us, but talk about the place of the apocalyptic in your journey and how that shaped your journey both as a Protestant and then as a Catholic. So why don't we begin, as we usually do, and have you give a little bit of your spiritual background. Sure. I was raised in a Christian family, Presbyterian, and um, it's interesting that as a child, I guess I had a, a childlike faith. I was a believer. And even then, I guess there, were, there was what you might call an apocalyptic shadow mm -hmm. over me, not because our Presbyterian church taught much about the end times, but because I grew up in the 60s. I still remember sure. the evening when, uh, with the Bay of Pigs. When I walked into the living room, my parents were glued to the TV set. President Kennedy was speaking. And I remember saying, Mom and Dad, what's going on? And they said, be quiet. We're about to have World War III. <laughs> and yeah. I was so terrified. I uh, went back to my room and just sat and thought, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? The next day in school, we were having drills, uh, how you get under your desk and you, you had to bring water and put it in the back in the cloak, cloak room there to, to keep. And, uh, and so the, sh the shadow of something like an apocalypse was hanging over me even at that time. I, for several years, at the age of 12, I became an atheist. I uh, was reading some of the wrong writers, and uh, I guess it was my form of adolescent rebellion. I had a seventh grade teacher who gave me a copy of uh, some writings by Voltaire, the skeptic uh, philosopher, okay. and that um, put me over the edge. And so for, uh, for six years, from 12 to 18, I tried to work out the implications of that, of, of not, mm -hmm. not believing in a God. But um, as someone has said, just as physically, if you're starved for good food, you'll eat garbage if you have to. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, the same was the case. I starved for good spiritual food. I went to spiritual garbage. I started tampering with the occult. And won't go into details, but right. during that time then uh, did discover the reality of the devil. Mm -hmm. In part because of that, had uh, the beginning of a conversion experience, realized that uh, 
if I didn't believe in a God, but there was a devil, I was in trouble. I'd, I better find out if there really was a God. And began to read the scripture, had Christians who testified to me of their own lives, um, turned to prayer as an experiment, had some prayers, very real, specific prayers answered. Uh, began reading C.S. Lewis. Another teacher gave me C.S. Lewis to read. And all those things came together at uh, Expo 72, a great convention sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ, 1972 in Dallas, Texas. I remember those expos. Yes. Yeah. Came, well, this is the big one, 100,000 people by the end of the week there. And at that week really came to the conclusion, yes, there is a God, yes, Jesus is who he said he was, mm -hmm. and I need him. So uh, all that happened, and, but, but the group of Christians that I, I came into at that time were very fascinated, very taken up mm -hmm. with apocalyptic themes. And well, that was very common back then. I of course it was. In fact, the, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, yeah. sold millions and millions of copies. It was the best-selling book in America of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And that book uh, spoke not just of his particular view of the end times, but of, also of this notion of the rapture, or some people call it the secret rapture. And this particular idea, uh, was very common in the circles I traveled in, is the idea that, uh, that not only is Jesus coming back in glory visibly to judge the world, you know, Catholics believe that, all Protestants believe that, the Orthodox believe that, it's a standard Christian teaching, but that before that time, he's coming in extra time, secretly and invisibly, to snatch away the true believers from the world so that they will be spared then the horrors of the Antichrist mm -hmm. and, and of the final part of the tribulation. And so we were taught that, and, and um, I believed it implicitly. I was still, I was 18 at the time. You tend to believe, uh, you know, when you're converted, the, the beliefs of the people around you. I was going to ask that very question. I mean, how, because that is an important question, how people can so easily believe an idea unquestionably, unexamined, and usually it is because somebody we trust deeply believes it. Yes. And, the, you know, the scripture doesn't really speak. It has to be read. It has to be interpreted. And as, as I've come to see in many ways since that time, you can have a certain lens through which you view the Scripture. Mm -hmm. And there you can find many things in the Scripture if you want to find them there. Um, what, to what extent, uh, then, did this issue shape you in your journey towards the Catholic Church? I mean, you've just expressed a basic... Well, first of all, let's go back a little bit. That view, make it clear, that view of the, of the rapture was, first of all, an escape from suffering? Yes, that there would be an escape from, from the Antichrist in particular in the very last part of the Great Tribulation as things got terrible on earth. So any, anyone who's not familiar with the rapture, but is familiar with the end time prophecies of Scripture, would understand that before the, the second coming of Christ is to be this Great Tribulation, they probably are more familiar with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. what the, ra the, the, the slant on the rapture is that during the Tribulation, the church will have already been removed. Yes, although there's disagreement among even the believers in the rapture, right. about when it will take place. Some would say at the very beginning of seven years of tribulation. Some would say three and a half years into it. Mm -hmm. And then others who actually agree with a more Catholic position, and that is that Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, okay. not at the beginning. So we've got all these different views mm -hmm. at this mm -hmm. point. Okay. So to what extent did this understanding in your own life affect your openness to the Catholic Church? Well, it's, it's a classic case of, uh, of why we need the Catholic Magisterium. As I began to, to read historical texts, my PhD is historical theology, in graduate school in particular, I began to read what the great Christian thinkers had thought about Scripture over the centuries. And I began to see that there were a number of very important Scripture passages that were interpreted in wildly different ways. And some of the wildest ways were passages that had to do with the end times, the, the end of the world. And I began to see not only did Protestants among themselves disagree sharply over these things, um, but that people often got into trouble because they interpreted these passages in very different ways. Would, uh, it would lead to armed revolts and takeovers of cities and things much like um, David Koresh or Jim Jones, that kind of thing yeah. throughout history. And so one of the things it did for me to start looking at apocalyptic thought and the history of it was to recognize that we really do need the church as the context and the authoritative interpreter of the scripture. If we read the, the scripture without the context of the church, especially when it comes to apocalyptic things, we can get into big trouble. Okay. Um, 
what I want to do in a moment is actually have you go into the scriptural foundation of the idea of the rapture, go through some of the text, and maybe a little bit of history of it. Before we go there, let's, here we are December 31st, with all that's happened in the last couple months uh, during the fall, okay? How, what are the rapture folk, how are they envisioning what's happening right now? Is this, are we at a time when they anticipate something coming very quickly, or have they been expecting it so long that they're losing, you know, losing uh, enthusiasm about the issue, or? Well, folks, <laughs> folks seem to have a very short memory when it comes to this kind of thing, and, it, and that's part of American culture in general. I'm, my specialty is American religion, and one of the characteristics, if you were to write down 10 characteristics of American culture and American religion is that we, we have historical amnesia. <laughs> Americans <laughs> tend to think of, I once had a friend who said to me, uh, well, I'm glad you're studying the church fathers, people like Charles Finney. Well, Charles Finney lived 100 years ago. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for him, that was the church fathers. Yep. So the, um, part of the problem is this historical amnesia. And uh, there's one particular television preacher, he will go unnamed at this point, who has just issued a book you know, kind of tying in the events of September with the biblical timetable for the end. Sure. And this same writer wrote a similar kind of book after the Gulf War making predictions. And other folks have done similar kinds of books that had to do with everybody from Henry Kissinger to you name it. And somehow people tend to forget that these things in these books didn't come to pass. Do, do these writers, and I've not read these books, do these writers make disclaimers of why the last one didn't turn true but this one is? Uh, it's usually not brought up <laughs> that, that an earlier book did not did I mean, not Hal pan Lindsay's out well. a good example of that. Well, he'd, yeah, he would revise his copies of the book after that first book. It sold so well, and then things didn't really pan out in the 80s the way he had predicted, so some revisions of the book. Um, that's how it tends going. to go. They keep going, which really sp speaks to, the, to the, the lurement of the idea behind this issue of the rapture and the end times, and, and maybe talk a bit of wh why it is so appealing to so many, and again, why people will take it from someone like these writers, unquestionably, just take their word at it and, and shape their life around it. Well, it, it is so appealing, first of all, the obvious thing. If, if you are convinced that the Antichrist is right around the corner and that the horrors described in the Bible are, are coming, are almost upon us, it's a very comforting notion yeah. that you won't have to face that. And certain writers have, have really played that up. You know, one particular writer who talks about, uh, can you go out, and it's a, a kind of a maudlin section in his book, where can you go out and look at your children playing in the sun and, and uh, face the idea that, that they may have to far face the horrors of the Antichrist? <laughs> in other words, so therefore you've got to have some kind of salvation experience or something to escape it. So that's part of it. Um, part of it is that because the world as a whole doesn't accept the idea, uh, there's, a, there's that delicious feel of we're, we're on the inside track we know something that's going to happen everybody doesn't know. Maybe more people know now that we've had all these books come out about it recently. Mm -hmm. But that um, we have kind of an insider's knowledge and, and we know what's going to happen. Right. And in certain times especially, right now, like right now, people love to cling to, to some message that tells them ex what, what, exactly what's going to happen. Well, as you were describing the way your parents felt back in the Bay of Pigs, mm -hmm. that's what so many of us felt back in September 11th. Sure. You know? I was trapped in an airport trying to get home, and all the planes were canceled, and didn't even, you know, the, we were only getting the bits and pieces of the news. I mean, yes. um, I'm sure many parents said the same thing that your parents said. We're on the verge of, of World War III, and, and here we are. We, we're still working through all the <laughs> impact that that's had in our lives these last couple months. Okay, let's give us a summary of the, of the rapture for the audience. They've heard of it. Some of them may have read it, books called the Left Behind series about mm -hmm. it. Where did it come from, and what's it based on? This is, um, first we have to understand that, that the, this discussion is not a Catholic versus Protestant discussion. Right. The rapture idea is, is relatively recent in church history. It's very popular in America right now, but the majority of Protestants throughout history have not only not believed it, but never even heard of it. Um, so that, for instance, even John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Wesley, some centuries later, um, all these folks that are, are looked to as the great leaders of, of Protestant faith would have found the idea alien. They had there's, there's nothing like this in their teachings. Um, the idea sprung up, sprung up in several places. The earliest time that we know about it for sure was in the 1700s here in America. The colony's a, a Baptist pastor. 
mm. who uh, wrote about it in a way that seems similar to this to the contemporary idea floating around. But then the more interesting episode <laughs> is that uh, around the turn of the 19th, beginning of the 19th century, around the year 1800, a few years before and after, uh, a Jesuit, a Catholic Jesuit from Chile, wrote in a book about the coming of Messiah the idea that sometime before the Antichrist that uh, Catholics who received the Eucharist faithfully and frequently would be taken out of the world for 45 days to escape some of the tribulation and then come back. And his book, which was written in Spanish, was translated by a man named Edward Irving in England, who was kind of a, a renegade pastor. He had been kicked out of one church because he taught that Christ's human nature was sinful and some other kind of strange ideas. Uh, he started a group called the, the Catholic Apostolic Church, which was really neither Catholic nor Apostolic. And this idea became very, he, he took this book in Spanish, he translated it into English, the idea stuck with him, appealed to him, and he began to preach it. About the same time, a man named John Darby from the well, Brethren we'll Church. A second. How did the church feel about that Jesuit's book? Well, it was not embraced by the church, that's for sure. I mean, it was just, it was left to obscurity. No okay. one, yeah, right. Within the Catholic Church, no recognition at all. Okay. And um, so then John Darby, John Darby yeah. was uh, the other leader. And this man, Darby in particular, was teaching the same. It's hard to know whether these two influenced each other, but at the same time, he was teaching it. He began to preach in America, the very popular revivalist in America that we're talking about now, the, the late 1800s, began to take on the idea. And then a man named C.I. Schofield, he was a lawyer, not a theologian, but who wrote a common notes, commentary notes for the Bible and published that as the Schofield Bible. And it was the best-selling Bible in America for a long, long time, may still be. And many folks in America then began to read his commentary, and his commentary reflected this idea. It was part of a larger system of thought called dispensationalism. We don't really have time to go into it. But. Yeah. So it became a very popular idea in America, and it appealed to Americans, um, many Americans at the time, because America was going through a difficult time. The Civil War had broken up the optimism that so many American evangelical Protestants had had. Before the war, most folks had the idea that the kingdom of God in America would come gradually through the Holy Spirit's work through Christians. And that's why you had so many Christians as a part of the abolitionist movement to, to end slavery, uh, as the temperance movement to end alcoholism, to help eventually to help women, um, to help the poor, that kind of thing. And they were convinced that God was going to build his new kingdom, the millennium, by the efforts of Christians. But the Civil War came, the optimism was exploded. Soon after that, then the industrialization of the rapid urbanization, uh, immigration, all these things began to threaten many people and they felt like their country and the society was going down the tubes. So at that point, this notion was a very appealing one. And yet even then, it's interesting that uh, I have a quote from a magazine during that time uh, uh, from Protestant evangelicals in which an evangelical um, revivalist says how he really dislikes this new secret rapture doctrine. He calls it God dishonoring. He says, I smite it wherever I go. I like that. <laughs> because he recognized that it, it tended to make people withdraw from society, to kind of give up on society and just hope and wait to be snatched out of their troubles. Which is what happened to the whole Millerite movement, right? Yes, now they didn't believe in a rapture, but they did believe Jesus was coming back, and so they kind of, they a lot of folks just gave up. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It wasn't a rapture idea, but it was it's kind of connected this idea of, of getting nailed down to a day and an hour when you calculate that this is when all this is going to happen, whether it's the rapture or a second coming, and then cashing all your chips in and, and, yes. and, and betting that that's when it's going to happen. And, and uh, in our lifetime, we've had a number of people that really come out in the <laughs> yes. print saying that... 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988. Yeah, it was, was a booklet a, that, mm -hmm. that went to all ministers in America. Uh, and I think the next year he came out, <laughs> next year or two, another follow-up to explain why it didn't happen and why it's coming again. Um, where is the scripture foundations for this? Is it totally... Uh, well, there, there are two passages where, uh, where most folks who would believe in the rapture would turn to. One is in uh, Matthew chapter 24, read that real quickly. Jesus, this is a long passage, and it's been debated throughout church history exactly what this passage applies to. Some folks believe that uh, Jesus' uh, apostles, the, the disciples ask him, um, when will the temple be destroyed? Because he just prophesied the temple would be destroyed. And what will be the sign of your coming? Thinking probably that these things were going to happen at the same time. As it turns out, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, Jesus' final coming 
hasn't happened yet. So Jesus' answer here seems to be responding to both parts of that question. Mm -hmm. Some folks uh, have interpreted this passage to mean that, that if you look at it in kind of a symbolic way, it all happened in 70 AD. Uh, others, though, think that there is part that is still to come. The, the folks who believe in the rapture are among those who think that, that a great deal of the passage is still to be fulfilled. And so when Jesus is talking about this, then they would read this to mean the end of, of the world. And, and personally, I think that it does apply to its final coming. Verse 36, chapter 24 of Matthew. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, that's important to keep in mind, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one is taken and one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One is taken and one is left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Now, you hear there were even movies in the 70s made uh, that they would have this idea that one is taken and one is left. You know, a husband is taken, a wife is left, or the other way around. Now, the interesting part of this passage, first of all, is you, you don't find people interpreting that passage in church history at all until maybe the last century. Uh, a lot of the people who believe in the rapture still don't even use this passage to support it. But I would say the key here to keep in mind is that it says that as in the days of Noah, this is what will happen, and that the flood came and swept away the unrighteous. Who are the ones left behind in the flood? No one is family. No one is family. The righteous. Right. Who are the ones taken? Yeah, the ones the unrighteous. To the so right. if it, even if you tried to interpret it in the way these folks have, in a more literal way than what it's saying, it seems to me, and, and has to many folks throughout church history, is that the righteous are the ones being left in security, and it's the wicked who are being swept away in judgment. Yeah. The very opposite of what a rapture teacher rapture, would say, yeah, that because yeah. they would say that it's the righteous who's being taken away, snatched away out of trouble, and the wicked who's being left behind. Mm. So that's one passage. The other, uh, perhaps a little, you know, a little more telling, is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Starting, start with verse 13. St. Paul is writing here, there's been some controversy in the church at Thessalonica about whether Jesus may have already come or not uh, and come secretly, which is kind of interesting uh, because there's some, still some people around. There are others who are wondering, is he going to come at all? Debate about it. So he says to them, we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, meaning those that are, are dead, that you may not grieve as others who do, have, do, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now it's interesting that in this passage, that the word rapture doesn't appear anywhere in the English translation of the Bible. But in this passage, uh, a Latin word that means to snatch, from which we get the word rapture, from St. Jerome's Vulgate, uh, is in this passage, and this is where the name rapture, rapture comes from. Rapture. So they take this passage to mean that this is Jesus' secret coming, snatching people away to meet him in the air. And uh, the short, I don't know if there's a short answer to tell, but th there's a very different way that this has been interpreted yeah. over the centuries, and that is that this is Jesus' final coming. It's nothing secret or quiet about it. You have the, the trumpet, the archangels call, the cry of command. But that just as in ancient times when people, when a dignitary came to a city and the people came out to greet him and escorted him back in as an honor, that Jesus, the image here is that Jesus is coming back in the clouds of glory and those who love him are caught up in the clouds of glory to meet him in the air and then to escort him back in to the city. It's not a separate coming, it is the final coming. Yeah, I was going to say that one of the key, couple of the key things are when you look at all the passages that refer to uh, these issues that are brought up. Every single one, if, again, if you compare them, all are pushing to, pushing to the second coming 
all the images drawn on the second coming of Christ. Uh, there's no direct reference to this intermediate coming, but they're all pushed to the second coming. And also, again, historically, that this particular view of this is such a minority view in history, not just Catholic Protestant, but within Protestantism itself. I know when I went to seminary, Protestant seminary, I mean, amongst the students at our evangelical seminary, every single possible apocalyptic un interpretation of scripture is represented mm -hmm. there by some student. And we used to have these arguments over coffee at dinner, over the pre-mill, the post-mill, the ah-mill, the post-toasty, you know, all the different ways of looking at it. And uh, it gets us to a couple questions. We're gonna take a break here in a little bit because I know we have some phone calls and emails. Is that some might say, well, you know, this is just one of many issues. It's not a big deal. I mean, so we have a different opinion on whether it was before or after. And I mean, is this just a minor issue? I don't think it is. And after the break, we can talk about that. But I think there are very serious consequences in a person's view of the Christian life okay. if they adopt this idea. And so we'll talk, maybe, maybe we'll get an email or a phone call on that issue on the importance of this. Another one I want to bring up is, uh, what about the popularity of, popularity of this idea in this series called the Left Behind series? Do you want to address that directly? Well, these folks are, are selling a lot of books uh, and, and related products, films, videos, children's products, and that kind of thing. Uh, the, the first book in the series is Left Behind, but there are eight others now in addition and some more to come, sure. and uh, have set new records of all kinds in Christian publishing for fiction with the numbers. So we're talking about in the millions, if you take them all together yeah. easily. And because the rapture is right at the heart of the storyline of these books, it happens at the, toward the beginning of the first book then uh, that idea is, is being popularized and not just among Protestants. I mean, it's, it's kind of like any other script for a book or a, a movie. I mean, there's an interesting twist to it, right? I mean, the idea that the, that the righteous are, are, are pulled out and you have this, this theme of some who are left and some who are taken away. So, you know, here's an airline. Isn't there a part? I didn't read the book oh, sure, myself. Yeah, the beginning, you know, sure, I, the beginning. I mean, it's, it, it is a very sensational kind of idea. Yeah. And that's another thing about American culture. We love sensationalism. Yeah that you've got airline pilots being snatched away and people off of airplanes and other places. So planes are crashing and cars are having accidents because the drivers are disappearing. And uh, a very horrific scene. So in one sense, you could say you know, it's an interesting spin on a, on a start of a story. Uh, authors are always looking for a good angle to come up with, the, come up with a new idea. So they might say, well, it's just a harmless story. But like so many other books, you know, is it that harmless? Well, the truth will set you free, our Lord Jesus said. So if the truth sets you free, uh, something that's not true is going to bind you. And that's what I'm convinced of, looking at church history especially. All right. Okay, well, uh, we've maybe opened up a couple cans, of hopefully not just cans of worms, but maybe some ideas for folk to ask questions about this because um, as you and I know from the converts that, that we know from our work, is that uh, one of the difficult issues is coming from, let's say, a Protestant understanding of the end times, and now we come into the Catholic understanding of the end times. And uh, it's not only that we're dealing with so many different Protestant views coming into the Catholic world, but we encounter Catholics that aren't real sure mm -hmm. what it is that we should believe about Scripture because we're surrounded by all these voices, like the Left Behind series or the Hal Lindsey books. Or and there's been very little catechesis in Catholic pulpits, especially in America, unfortunately. There's a vacuum of teaching about what the church teaches about the end of the world. And in that vacuum, other things will get sucked in, and they have. All right. We've primed a lot of pumps. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. Oh, during the break, uh, you should see some information, uh, an address, phone number, because we'd like to offer, uh, if you're interested in this issue, that Paul is putting together uh, a, a brochure, a small article. Yeah, a, a pamphlet, more like a pamphlet or a booklet. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. pamphlet or booklet. Um, it's going to be entitled, res it's re entitled Responding to the Rapture, a Catholic Critique of Rapture Fever. If you're in it's free, right? That's right. It's, if you're interested, you'll see in the address and phone number during the break for a free copy of this uh, brochure. And we'll be back in just a moment with your questions.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Dr. Paul Thigpen, and I hope you're enjoying this segment a little bit different than the usual Journey Home program, but I thought it was appropriate as we are here at the, this crossroads into the new year. We are surrounded by so many voices that have so many different opinions about the future, and some of them seem seemingly innocent. Others uh, are having a great impact on our lives, influencing what we should do with our money and how our plans should be for the future. So it's an important issue and uh, we'll look at your phone calls and emails to see in what ways this has uh, intrigued you uh, for tonight. Let's take our first uh, email, if we would. It comes from Joe, Port Arthur, Texas. Dear Dr. Thigpen, how do you as a Catholic reconcile the Holy Father's admonition to be not afraid in the seemingly chaotic state of current affairs in our world today? And how would you have formally viewed this situation as an evangelical? Thank you, Joe, for your email. It's a great question. I'd I think we have to realize first that that be not afraid. It is a biblical admonition. And when it was spoken, things were pretty tough too. <laughs> and again and again, we hear the Lord saying to us, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And yet, the people who first heard those words were often tortured, killed, persecuted, run into the caves and the hills, uh, had terrible things to have to face. So it's not as if the Holy Father has some naive uh, admonition to us, oh, don't worry, you know, be, don't worry, be happy kind of thing. He knows that we're facing some difficult things. But the truth is that uh, if we fear God, we don't have to fear anybody else. And things can be difficult, things will be difficult, things are difficult for a number of people right now who have suffered so much in the last few months. And yet, the Lord says to us, be not afraid. Yeah. Because if our eyes are on eternity, I mean, we tend to just look at the circumstances around, but if our eyes are on God and on eternity, then the other things we realize, that, as St. Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Yep. If we keep our, our love on Him, then yep. death, sword, fire, famine, terrorism, as horrible as those things are, nevertheless, they cannot separate us from His love mm -hmm. now and in eternity. So that's, I think that's a wonderful It's really Peter admonition. passing along the same advice that Jesus was giving him when Jesus was beckoning Peter out onto the That's water right. to walk. That's be right. not afraid, be not afraid. And to keep your eye on Jesus. And that's what John Paul is telling us. In the midst of all, uh, don't lose hope. I mean, that's the key. Don't that's lose right. hope. And Our don't hope let go is, of God. Yeah. Don't let go that's of right. God. Now, it's interesting that they asked the second part of the question, how would I have viewed things maybe a little differently as a Protestant evangelical? Well, in part, during the time when I would have believed in the rapture idea, that phrase would have meant more to me, don't be afraid because you're going to be snatched out when mm -hmm. things get really bad. And, um, and I'm not saying that every person who believes in the rapture doesn't have some notion of that we're go we've got to suffer. That's so clear in the scripture. But nevertheless, it's very important, I think, for us to recognize that the rapture idea, one of the problems of it is that it can lead to a, a skewed understanding of suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that becoming a Catholic was so important to me and to my wife both we tended, we came from a background where a lot of folks tended to either assume or imply that if you suffered, it was because there was sin in your life or something was wrong in your relationship with God. Because this kind of health, wealth gospel, this idea that if, if you're really with God, then he's going to bless you, bless you, bless you. Yeah. And of course he had blessed us, blessed us, blessed us, but there were still things we suffered. We lost a child, we had you know, other terrible things, my father died of cancer. Yeah. and. Um, and, you know, someone in the family even told my father at one point that he was dying of cancer because he didn't have faith. So to come out of that into the Catholic understanding that suffering can be redemptive mm. if we join our sufferings to the Lord's sufferings, that then all that wonderful grace that flowed through his suffering flows through us as well and yeah. from us, through us to others. Mm. And that through our suffering, we can, we can really take part in helping the world. All right, good. Let's take this next caller. This is Carol from Georgia. What's your question for us tonight? Hi there. Hello. I'm also a former Protestant, and I'm constantly getting feedback from Protestant relatives saying, well, don't you think Jesus is coming back soon? Don't you think the rapture is coming based on the wake of all the tragedy that we've had in the country? And I know also what you've said about how only the Father knows the hour and how we shouldn't be afraid, but would it be wrong to put back supplies and food just in case something happens? Well, thank you, Carol. I've heard those words before a couple of years ago when we were, uh, so many of us were concerned about the Y2K bug and, uh, and then there's those 
who also connected mm -hmm. apocalyptic issue to it. Well, what about the issue of preparing? Well, it depends on what, you know, what you're preparing for, I think. The book of Proverbs is clear about, talks about how the ant works hard and saves up for the hard times, and that we should imitate the ant that way. Um, and, and the scripture is very practical in that way. We are to take care of those who depend on us. And, uh, you know, we, we've put up food. We've, yeah. We have water. We, I live in an area where hurricanes sometimes come through. That's a small thing. It's not the apocalypse. So I think it's, it's important to recognize that it's fine to take practical measures in case there should be trouble. We, we could have a terrorist attack tomorrow that led to all kinds of problems with supplies, and, uh, right. and a lot of folks would need food and water, that kind of thing. But that's different from thinking that Jesus is coming tomorrow and, and I'll get snatched out, out of all the trouble, so I shouldn't have to do any kind of preparation. Yeah, that is interesting because it can lead to the other side. The rapture exactly. could actually say, mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He's going to take me away tonight. I won't mm -hmm. be here. Uh, in fact, isn't it true that there's some of the rapture type groups that actually have tapes and different issues to leave behind? Yes, uh, and that's in the film. I th and I think some folks have is actually that done is? that. Okay. that if, if they get snatched away, then they've left this videotape, and they're, so the people behind are supposed to watch it to see what really happened and now what they have to do. Yeah. But I think that the, you know, the caller's point, I think, is one that we ought to take in this last couple of years in the sense that uh, maybe we should be awakened to how d over-dependent we've become on technology. And uh, I just saw today, I was flying on the airplane here, that uh, the airlines lists that how many gallons of fuel that particular airline's mm -hmm. company uses every year, and they burnt the average of, I think, 5,100 uh, gallons of fuel a minute oh my. in all of their mm -hmm. planes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're living as if that, that all of this stuff is just going to last forever. We live our lives as if it's going to last forever. And what kind of a world are we leaving for our children? The rapture idea kind of leaves the idea, don't have to worry about it. Right. We won't be, be here. But the other side of it is the panic side mm -hmm. is to kind of withdraw from all society. Make a fortress. Make a fortress and a bunker full of food. And, and, and where's the gospel? The need of telling uh, those outside. So I think we, we need to prepare. But the, the most important way, and I'm not saying don't prepare materially, is uh, you, you even get it out of the Columbine situation where uh, I was just uh, reading something from someone there, a, a minister in the area, who was saying how many of the children realized after that that they really need to tell the people they love that they love them. They may not get another chance. Yeah. That's a different kind of being taken away and someone being left behind. Uh, many of the ancient church fathers talked about how people would debate, will I be here when Jesus comes again? And their, their answer would be, well, he's coming for you at death, one way or the other. Right. So there, w whether you're here when everybody <laughs> gets judged or whether it's just going to be your individual meeting with him, nevertheless, you need to prepare yourself for that. What is it in your life that isn't, isn't straight with him? I mean, really, the issue that, that this caller was talking about is the call of the gospel is simplicity. I mean, it truly is. It's, it's hard to go there because our, mm -hmm. everywhere our culture all around us is trying to as we've just gone through a whole month of preparation for Christmas, and now here we are after Christmas, and and uh, you know the packages, some of the presents have been opened and played with a little bit. Now they're over in a corner somewhere. I mean that's the way it is our lives. So quickly move on, move on. But are we taking the time to examine our lives? I mean really that's what this night is usually all about: mm -hmm. is looking ahead to this coming year, and are there ways that we ought to prepare our lives physically? Uh, spiritually, emotionally, for the future. Uh, take a stop and examine our lives. Uh, in fact, that's what our next email is drawing our attention to, is this issue of, of looking ahead spiritually. This email comes from Elizabeth uh, Fossing, uh, New Year's Eve 2001. Dear Marcus and Dr. Thigpen, my confessor has for many years told me to pick one thing, one resolution at a time to work on in my interior life. But how do I trans smith this idea to my teenage children or do i let them work things out on their own how is, as a parent can i encourage them to grow in virtue a lot of good questions in the midst my, of my my how many hours do we have here <laughs> 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 well with my own kids i've got uh got a 19 year old and just about 13 year old that we've um, 
first of all, we set the example. We try to set the example in these things. But we, it's, it's another part of this spiritual preparation. We don't assume too much about where they're going spiritually. We have to ask them sometimes. Sometimes when my son and I are riding somewhere, I'll say, well, what's the Lord saying to you? Yeah. Or, um, you know, how was, what was your response to that homily the other day? Or, why don't you come with me to, to adoration? That kind of thing and to try to judge the response. And so I'm not overbearing with it, I don't think, by any means. But, uh, but they know that I'm concerned, inter interested about it. And uh, I think it's a good idea, the confessor's idea there, about taking one thing at a time. I know if I make a list of 15 or 20 things, uh, I may not get past two or three. And if that's the case for us, how much more so for our teenage children to take on one, take on one thing and focus on it? Mm. Yeah, that's what that one email was asking about, the one thing at a time. And uh, how about some, let's talk about resolutions a little bit. Uh, do you find this issue of making resolutions any different as a Catholic than you may have viewed it when you were a Protestant? Well, some of the things I resolved to do are certainly different. Um, one of the things I've resolved to do for this year is, is to spend more time in Eucharistic adoration. Mm -hmm. um, I've, back in uh, earlier this year, compiled a book of, prayers and meditations from saints and other right. Christian leaders throughout the centuries about the importance of Eucharistic adoration and prayers for that wrote some. And it rekindled in me this desire to spend more time with Jesus in his Eucharistic presence. And, uh, and that really, that, that's begun to be a little flame. We, we were, uh, our, our Eucharistic adoration chapel had been closed for renovations, now we started again. Mm -hmm. And my whole family is finding that that's a, a wonderful thing to have rekindled. So in the new year, I want to spend more time doing that. That's something I would never have thought of, of course, as, a, right. as an evangelical. It, I know one thing, the way it affected me was, again, it depends on which <laughs> branch of Protestantism you come from. And I came from the branch of Protestantism that uh, focused on external justification. Hmm. You know, once, once you've accepted Jesus, you're saved, and he washes you clean with his blood. So that one day when you stand before God and he asks, why, will, why should I let you into my kingdom? We just point to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so God no longer sees our sins. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. Well, the, the downside of that imbalanced theology, is, is my view of it, is that it can lead to complacency mm -hmm. and a call to holiness. Uh, because it's Jesus' righteousness, not mine. I know I'm called out of gratitude to be different. Uh, but in the end, the bottom line subtly is this always emphasis, well, it's, it's Christ's righteousness, not mine. And plus there's also the underlying uh, attitude that because of my depravity, I could never do it anyway. There isn't a thing I can do. And the reality is that, that that's not an imbalanced way of looking at our spiritual journey. And so, I mean, the reality is that we're called to be holy. We're called to be different. And in fact, uh, we find in the letter of 1 John, when, when John says that the reason, he says in the beginning of chapter 2 of 1 John, my little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. There's an implication there. Is that the author of that letter is writing that because he believes that by God's grace, we can grow in holiness yes. to the point where we can conquer <clears throat> at least the majority of external sins and then we deal with the internal sins of our heart. You know, those are the ways that we should be guided, I think, in our resolution of the coming year, this issue of calling to holiness. Uh, let's take this email. Good. We have one here from Betty from Kuhlman. Dear Marcus and Dr. Thigpen, help! <laughs> if you don't recommend the Left Behind series, what should we read? My husband loves those books. What can I recommend to take their place? Well, I'd, I'd like to see more good Catholic fiction. We have some good stuff. If, if, uh, if you really like end time stuff, I'd recommend The Lord of the World by Robert Benson, Monsignor oh, yes. Robert Benson. Yeah, tell more about that. I mean, that's about 100 uh, years old. A remarkable now. book. It's over, yeah, it came out at the turn of the last century by Monsignor Convert. And uh, when you keep in mind that he was writing over 100 years ago and then read the book and realize how much he foresaw that has come to pass, it's remarkable. It's a story about the coming of the Antichrist and how the Antichrist um, weasels his way into the hearts of the world mm -hmm. and begins to persecute the church then. And I want to give more details about it. But if you like apocalyptic fiction, that's a, right. that's a wonderful thing. Um, Michael O'Brien. That's right. Father Elijah. 
and some sure. of the other books in that series yeah. would be some great fiction to read. Mm -hmm. But also, I'd, I'd say um, you know, there are other good things to read besides yeah. just fiction or popular. I'm going to remind the audience yeah. again of that of the free uh, article that you can get if you write to uh, Dr. Thigpen's address and phone number that'll be on the screen. This article not only will be a, a thumbnail of this, but it will lead you to some other areas, some other articles, some other books that will help you. Uh, you know, and I'll, I hate to make this program, of all things, uh, an infomercial for, for my own books. Uh, I hesitate that, but I have been slaving on a novel for about three years and uh, we're still working on the title. I think it's going to be called How Firm a Foundation. It should be out in a couple months. And in reality, is it deals with a little bit of this. Not exactly, though. It, it, it's the background in the book. But the issue deals with this issue of the need for a guide to teaching what is true. It questions the issue of, uh, is the scripture alone a sufficient foundation for faith? So we'll... I'll let you know if the book ever gets done. It's been an albatross <laughs> on my neck for three years now, but my hope is it will be out uh, anytime soon. Well, maybe I should recommend then my one novel, Gehenna. <laughs> That's right. It's, uh, it takes place in hell. starts out in Atlanta, which some people say is next door to hell, but <laughs> since I'm from Georgia, I can get away with saying that. The, um, but it's, it's uh, kind of a modern footnote on Dante's Inferno. And if you like the kind of excitement yeah. and, and action that you get, this is a... It's a very Catholic novel, even though I wrote it before I became Catholic. Yeah. Might be interested in that. Yeah, well, it's, again, if you write for the free uh, article, it'll we'll say a little bit about that. What well, if we have any loose ends we need to tie up here? Uh, did, we, did we cover, do you think, in your mind? Um, well, let me ask you this. Well, I, I would like to say that, that there's some folks who might think that it's really not, that this idea is kind of innocuous, this rapture idea. What's the big deal? What's the problem here? And... Um, part of the problem are some things we've mentioned, that it, it has, uh, I think, a, a, a deficient notion of suffering and the role of suffering in the life. We're not to escape it, even with the Antichrist. The Catholic Church teaches very clearly, and we haven't even really talked about explicitly what the Catholic right. Church teaches, but teaches very clearly, you can see it in the Catechism, that before Jesus comes again in glory at the end of time, that the Church will have her own passion, her own Paschal story to have to, to live through, that the Church will suffer under Antichrist, that the church will suffer in the tribulation. Christians will, and, the, and that can be redemptive, but we won't escape it. So that's very clear teaching there. So I think that's a problem. It's a problem if, if it makes you, as it does a lot of people, think that you should just drop out of society and not try to work to change it because it's all going down the tubes anyway. So I think that, that's important. But the other thing we have to recognize, and this is difficult to say, but it's true, is that there is a Catholic, an anti-Catholic uh, bias within the Left Behind books. Yeah. Uh, the Pope in there gets raptured, but he only gets raptured as a true believer because he has turned away from the historic orthodoxy of the Catholic Church and is now believing what Martin Luther taught in the Reformation. The next Pope after him becomes the tool of the Antichrist for a new world religion, a fake religion, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it can in be fact, very he dangerous. Has, accompanying the Left Behind series is a nonfiction book. That's right. Are we living in the end times? And in that, they specifically call the Catholic Church a pagan Babylon. Yeah. So uh, the folks who wrote that book, unfortunately, uh, want to get Catholics out of the Catholic Church. Yes. And what's really sad is that when you go to any large bookstore that features this particular series and you look in the children's section, there's also a very large section for young readers. And that's why it is important to be informed about what the Church truly teaches on this, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, to recognize that this is not the, even the main Protestant view at all. It's a very small view. That's I'd very encourage, popular. But. I'd encourage viewers to go to the Catechism Look in paragraph 670 and paragraphs following and around that section. That's where most of the, the church's teaching is summarized on the end times. All right. All right, Paul, thank you very much for thank joining you, us. God bless you, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you and your family, and uh, also God's blessing on all your writing, because how many books have you written so far? This last one was 25. 25 books. Yeah. Hope that God continues to bless you in that as you proclaim the gospel through your writing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some closing words for the journey home.
Welcome back. We've got a new year ahead of us, a lot of things to be excited about, a lot of concerns. We're called to pray for peace and to work for peace in our lives. And, uh, you know, Jesus told us not to get caught up in trying to figure out a day or an hour of his second coming. There's lots of reasons for that because, as, as Scripture says, that's only uh, known by the Father. But I've always felt that one of the reasons we are to do that is because as soon as we get focused on a day or an hour, we put all our eggs in that basket, if that day and hour comes and goes without it coming in it, it fulfillment, we lose all of our motive. We lose our hope. Just like here we are making resolutions for the coming year to be different, but how many times in the past have we done that and only three days later that bad habit is right back again? So as we look to this year, let's, let's follow the advice of Jesus to always be ready. He can come anytime and to live our life in holiness and imitation of him. I'd like to end this year with this verse from 2 Corinthians. It says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. Make that a resolution this year. But with his grace, accepting all of his promises, in the midst of all that we go through together, praying for one another, let's seek to grow in holiness in the fear of God, fear of nothing else but he who loves us and sent his son for our salvation. May that be our prayer together as we walk together following Christ on the journey home. God bless. I'll see you next week.